The Overcome and Conquer show is presented by The Project. The Project is a full immersion, 75-hour experience designed for men who know in their core they are not living up to their fullest potential. Rather than waking up every morning ready to dominate life, the mediocre man rolls out of bed and slides into the same unfulfilling routine they've unhappily been in for way too long. The Project is for men that have lost their internal flame and motivation to conquer. It's for men living an unfulfilling life that lacks excitement and purpose. Sound familiar? Then listen up. The Project is specifically designed to challenge you mentally and physically. We push you to the ledge of self-limiting beliefs and prove you've got much more in the tank. We kill the bitch and unleash the beast. We uncover the demons that hold you back and turn extreme pain into superpowers to dominate life. In the end, we turn mediocre men into modern day knights. We forge a brotherhood and bond that levels you up as a better husband, father, and friend. But the project is not for every man. In fact, it's not for most. For men who are okay with being in a rut and achieving less than their fullest potential, the project isn't for you. If you're not willing to put in the work to fix what isn't working, the project isn't for you. However, if you're done white-knuckling it through life, living one day at a time with no sense of purpose, and are willing to do what it takes to improve, the project holds the key to unlocking the next chapter. Graduates of the project join a brotherhood of modern-day knights and become the authors of their destiny. They have their fire reignited and reclaim dominance over their family, fitness, finances, and faith. If this resonates with you and you want to learn more, we encourage you to apply today at www.mdkproject.com forward slash OC show. Everybody wants to be on top of the mountain. The problem nowadays is people want to get dropped off at the top of the hill and look down. It's that I overcome mindset that makes all the difference. See, the way we're taught is you're going to claw, you're going to scratch, you're going to bite, you're going to dig, you're going to do whatever it takes to get to the top of that mountain. That unequivocally is how I have managed to keep myself moving forward and finding success. Two seals, one mission. The Overcome and Conquer Show. And welcome back to the Overcome and Conquer Show. It is another amazing episode, you guys. I got to tell you, we have an absolutely, absolutely incredible guest today. As a matter of fact, we may have to go with our official military titles for this show. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm actually fucking nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> we talked to him before this and I was just- I you, am. You, I'm, you were quaking Well, I mean, you know, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but in the SEAL community- ooh, I just did, um, you know, I'm a little nervous, you know, he was like two ranks higher than me. So, um, (laughs) so I'm a little nervous. Two two ranks exponentially, my friend, but that's all right. We will, uh, we will jump in that. So how you been? I've been good. I've been, uh, you know, the boot camps are taking off, uh, projects kicking ass, LTDs. Um, you know, we've been doing some stuff together, uh, Life's good, you know, as long as I'm not six feet under the dirt. You know me, man. I'm I'm, I'm happy. Amen. Amen. We're yeah. still breathing right yep. side of the earth. And uh, the project, mm. Overcome and Conquer show presented by the project. Yes, For those of, you that are, those of you that are looking, if you are a man out there and you're looking to push yourself, mm-hmm. mm, the project is where it's at. I want to know what you're made out of. Yeah. Instructor Care over here, along with some other amazing individuals, Mr. Fitbeard, Mr. Matt Snyder, the the uh, Marine, crazy Marine himself, Steve <laughs> Eckhart, and of course, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Bedros Koulian, who would be the CEO of it. And I'm, I'm technically the mad master chief who kind of facilitate things, so... So, so technically, I, instead of being the captain now, I've the, I, I actually consider myself giving myself a promotion. I'm the master chief. I heard well, that. You guys <laughs> have uh, you guys have put together something great. So for those out there who are looking really to get on, to take yourself to a higher level, you definitely need to check out the project. The project so. www.mdkproject.com. Check it out. So we are uh, we're, we're post New Year, my friend. We are into 2020. I know we are uh, getting ready for me to have a birthday coming Dude, up soon. What are you turning like? What at sixty one? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I will be forty eight years young. So forty eight years young. Um, you know, age is a number. It's mindset, baby. Well, it's, thank God you 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 look like you're twenty five. I feel it. You know, yeah. it's uh, I married I married out of my league, and that's what keeps that me going to the true. gym. You know her. That you is know my long haired. I do. I know She's yours. Amazing. So. 
All right, man. Well, we're off to the races in 2020. I know both of us are out there. My new book, Overcome, is out and it has been getting amazing reviews. I've been getting Boom. so much great feedback. As a matter of fact, the reason we have the guest on our show today is because he contributed to this book and he gave some amazing insight on leadership, overcoming adversity, how we hold ourselves accountable, all key things in Overcome. Technically, I heard it was a barn burner between you adding what I had to say and him, and I think he beat me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's not laughing, but it was a joke, sir. <laughs> so, no. All right. Well, let's jump right in. We're going to jump right into our guest. I got to tell you, we are honored to have him on. He served 37 years with the United States military, the United States Navy, to be exact. Mm. He was the ninth commander of the Special Operations Command. He was the chancellor of the University of Ch Texas. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He is a YouTube sensation. <laughs> <laughs> he is, yeah. He is a father, a husband, a friend, and most importantly, most importantly. Say it, say it. He is an American UDT SEAL diver. A lover, a fighter, a shooter, a rootin' tootin' paratroopin', scuba diving, demolition, double cap crimping, frog man. It is our, and he was the bullfrog of the community. Yes. He had the most service as a Navy SEAL in the history of our community at that time of his career. So it is our great honor to introduce the legendary teammate and friend, Admiral Bill McRaven. Welcome to the Overcome and Conquer Show. Hey, thanks, Jay. Thanks, guys. It's uh, great to be here with you. We are honored to have you on, as we do with every show. Uh, go ahead. Well, I actually wanted to do something. If if I can use your power, sir, for a second. Wait um, on me. Wait, all wait. Right. Yeah, well, hold on. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I don't get What's a four happening? star on here, too, here too often. <laughs> so, and I'm sure you remember me. Um, from, you know, be, me being an E5, but <laughs> you're definitely, uh, or actually, Ray, you're very unforgettable. So. No, but sir, <laughs> Jason, obviously you understand was an 03. Let's see, 03, 10, I'm doing the math. That's seven levels higher. Okay. So could you, or would you for me, you're, you're high, much higher, four-star admiral. I mean, I want to make that very clear to everybody. This is the, the cream, cream of the crop. Could you make Jason call me, sir, and salute me? Do you have that power? So as I understand it, though, you were a five, I was a four, he was a three, so I think we both need to salute you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You know what? That oh, was yeah. the greatest math I've ever seen oh, done. Yeah. Well, so, hold on. If that's going to happen, you know, <laughs> I just, yeah, I'm not. So basically, the Admiral just told me I need to salute you. Salute me. So, you know what, Raymond, for you. Wait for me to drop it. Oh, that's a good carry on. <laughs> all right, thank nice. you. I'm How's not even going to. I'm not so, even going to play that game. With even you. out of uniform, y'all look good doing that. Ah, thank, thank you, sir. Know. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, yeah, we try and have a lot of fun on the show. Obviously, Ooh. the frogman humor, and it was one of the big things that uh, I, I finished reading sea stories this weekend. I really enjoyed it. There were some amazing stories of your career. But uh, Admiral, one of the greatest things and one of the things that I love about the community, it's one of the things that Ray and I have in the show, it's the camaraderie. It's the shenanigans that oh. have gone on. Uh, there were a lot of stories in your book that uh, you brought out the humor. Uh, definitely one of the ones that I thought was hysterical because anybody that has done a lot of civilian fl flying when you're in the military, I don't know what it is. If there is a direct flight, you're going to take six legs yeah. to get where you're going. <laughs> and and you are always in the absolute worst seat on the plane. And you make that reference in the book. That, 32A. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can always smell everything coming out of the head on 32A. Yeah, so I loved I loved your joke about either they either they thought I had a small bladder or just like to always get off the plane last. So I, I mean it. that's good stuff. So Ray, you and you and the Admiral have uh, some connections. Here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> sir, obviously uh, fellow SDVers. All right. Most most of these guys don't know what the hell we're talking about because we were the real. That's real frogman stuff. That's th <laughs> <laughs> it's like he can read my mind. <laughs> but um, there is a story. There's legend that has it that. Um, you guys were doing something off the coast of Viegas. You were doing it with, at the time was an E5 who was now, was my senior chief. That's, that's how old school you are, sir. And, um, I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on that because 
the word on the street was, as you were waiting for an extraction, I'll let you get into it. And you guys started telling some stories because like frogmen do. And maybe you can elaborate on that and of, of what happened, what transpired from <laughs> transponder, what transpired from that, um, from that message. Cause that's what I think people want to hear is like how you just did the crazy shit that we did back in the day. And there, there was a little <laughs> surprise. Yeah. A little surprise. Tell them the surprise. Well, so, so let me let's set the context for you here. So this is 1986. And, uh, and we were preparing for a very classified mission at the time to go against uh, Gaddafi, Muammar Gaddafi's oil pumping stations off the coast of Libya. Now, remember, Gaddafi had been involved in a number of terrorist operations, state-supported terrorist operations. We had the goods on him, so the plan was to, to go back and, and do a kind of proportional strike on him. But so, so for your audience, recognizing what a sealed delivery vehicle is, so this is a wet submersible. So think of it as a, you know, a man torpedo, if you will, with a shell over the top of it. So you have a pilot and a navigator in the front, and you can cram a couple more guys in the front, but they better be small. And then you have a compartment in the back where you can put a couple of seals. So the pilot and navigator deliver about four seals maybe to the objective. Well, this particular mission required uh, us to go, and there were a pilot and a navigator, and I was the Navy lieutenant in the back of the boat. Uh, and, and with me, I had all the demolition, I had all the beacons, and our objective was going to be to launch from a big submarine, because these little mini submarines launch from a big submarine at about 40 foot depth, and then you go up to about 15 feet, and then we would travel for several hours, come to the Libyan oil rigs, if you think of them that way. We would go down to the bottom of these uh, pumping stations, load them with demolition, and then go to the next one, and there were three of them. So we were rehearsing this mission off the coast of Viegas, off Puerto Rico. And so this particular night, and it was a long ass mission. I mean, these were 12 hour missions. So when you think about being underwater for 12 hours, you can imagine how challenging that is. But this particular night was going to be a search and rescue mission. And the idea was going to be that if in fact we were off the coast of Libya and we had problems with our sealed delivery vehicle and we had to surface, then we would deploy a beacon, a radio beacon, a transponder that would initiate a signal to a, to a P-3 hel uh, airplane that would signal a helicopter and the helicopter would come get us. So that's what we were doing this particular night. So we launched from the big submarine and we traveled for about an hour or so and we surfaced. And again, this was just a rehearsal, but as we are off the coast of Viegas, Puerto Rico, this is an island off Puerto Rico, uh, we get to the surface and I'm in the back. I pull out the sonar buoy and I, I initiate the pinger. So the sonar buoy starts pinging, and this ping is supposed to be sending a signal to the airplane. Well, we're expecting to get picked up in about you know, 30 or 40 minutes. And so we wore kind of shorty wetsuits. So we were not very warm, particularly because we didn't think it'd be a long mission. So as we surface the boat, the boat gets buoyant. And so the three of us are kind of sitting on top. Uh, the pilot and the navigator, Dave Roberts, as you mentioned, was one of them sitting on the, uh, on the top of the boat, and I'm sitting on the boat. We're waiting. So an hour goes by, and then two hours goes by, and then three hours goes by. And, of course, we are drifting out in the middle of the ocean. We have no safety boat. We, know, we don't know where we are now because we've been drifting for hours. It is really getting cold. The weather is coming in. Things are really looking bad. And, of course, as the officer, you know, the, 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 two, the two enlisted guys, you know, they're, they're obviously not happy, but they're uh, – but they are troopers, both great guys. And so I'm thinking, well, what can I do to kind of lift their spirits? So as you tend to do in these situations, I'm looking for a joke. Now, again, to set the scene, you got three frogmen sitting on the top of this man torpedo. We're in these short wetsuits. We are freezing our ass off. We are lost at sea, essentially, not knowing whether or not the helicopter has picked up the beacon. The submarine doesn't know where we are. So I start telling this joke. And the joke is a simple one. It's a gorilla walks into a bar. And I remember Dave turning to me going, hey, boss, this had better be good because we're really miserable out here. <laughs> so I said, I got it, I got it. So a gorilla walks into the bar. And, of course, the bartender sees the gorilla. And he runs back to his manager and says, hey, a gorilla just walked in the bar. What should I do? And the manager says, well, go see what he wants. So the bartender comes up to the gorilla and he says, uh, yeah, can I help you? And the gorilla says, I'd like a gin and tonic. So the bartender goes back to the manager and says, hey, the gorilla wants a gin and tonic. 
manager says, I tell you what, get him a gin and tonic, but charge him $9 for the drink. Guy says, no, he'll, he'll tell me, tear me apart. And he says, nah, the girl is not very smart. He'll never know the difference. <laughs> so the bartender goes up, gives him a gin and tonic, says, that'll be $9. Grillo reaches into his pocket, gives him a 10. The bartender gives him a change. And uh, the bartender goes back to the manager and says, hey, you were right. Grillo didn't care. He's not very smart. A few minutes later, Grillo pounds on the bar. Bartender comes over, says, yeah, he said, like another gin and tonic. Gets him a gin and tonic. Grillo gives him a 10, gives him a $1 change. And, and about that time, the, the helicopter starts to come. We can hear the helicopter coming. But, of course, I'm carrying on with the joke. And the, the bartender comes up to the gorilla, and he says, you know, we don't get too many gorillas in here. Well, about that time, Dave goes, hey, I hear the helicopter. So all of a sudden, I stop the joke. The helicopter starts to come, but it's windy. It's bad seas out there. We're rocking and rolling. The helicopter's having trouble. It takes us about 45 minutes. Finally, we get, we get hoisted up into the helicopter, and the three of us travel back to Roosevelt Roads. Well, I get back to Rosie Roads, and we're going back to our barracks area. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, a master chief petty officer, a, a uh, master at arms, so like a military police, comes to our barracks and says, uh, looking for Lieutenant McRaven, looking for me. He says, uh, Commander Mabry wants to see you, and the admiral wants to see you. I said, what admiral? Yes, sir, I was just told to come get you. So they grab me. We go all the way across, about 45 minutes, and we go all the way across the, uh, the base to an empty parking lot. And there in the empty parking lot is Commander Bob Mabry, who had been the commander of the, the team, and this admiral, who I don't know. And so they're talking to me, and they say, hey, we, we, we need you to come debrief the, tonight's mission. So I walk into this hangar, and there are about 200 people in the hangar. <laughs> I don't know where the hell these people came from. I don't know who they are. And so the admiral says, you know, let me introduce you to all the people that are kind of behind the scenes, that have been monitoring your mission tonight. And I'm thinking, monitoring our mission? So as typical with sailors, we had been sitting on the top, I mean, bitching about everybody, about the commanding <laughs> officer of the submarine, about our own commanding officer, oh, no. about you know the lurid affairs that these guys had been involved in team over time. Team guys. <laughs> all, you know, team guys Holy stuff, right? Shit. And that's exactly what I'm thinking. You have got to be kidding me. And so... Everybody, all these 200 people, they're looking at me. I'm, I'm still in my wetsuit. And, uh, and he says, well, we'd like you to, to debrief the 200 folks on the mission. I said, okay, sir. He says, but before you do that, we want to know what the punchline is. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the punchline? What punchline? He goes, you did know there was a microphone in that buoy, didn't you? And, of course, they had been listening to everything we had said. Uh... And so, of course, they all start laughing. I'm the, the brunt of the joke. And so I, I had to tell them the punchline. The punchline was the bartender comes up to the gorilla and says, you know, we don't get too many gorillas in here. And the gorilla said, well, hell, for $9 a drink, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, not a very funny joke. <laughs> but the joke was on me because these folks had been listening to everything we'd been saying all night long. Wow. But I tell the story about, uh, so the mission doesn't go. Uh, as you recall, this was called El Dorado Canyon. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the Air Force came in and actually bombed uh, Gaddafi's uh, headquarters. But about a month or so after that, I am driving into work, and no kidding, I'm turning on the radio, and this was the old dial radio. I'm turning on the radio, and I hear from the DJ on the radio, you know, we don't get too many gorillas in here. And the gorilla says, well, hell, for $9 a drink, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and that is a no shit true story that I heard <laughs> that joke told over the radio after this, uh, this classified event. So somehow that was too good a story to, uh, to be kept secret. I love that, it. That's love off it, sec. That's off sec for you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I can only imagine, man, sitting there, dude. I mean, for all of us, we've sat there on those long, dark, hard, cold missions and, Dude, all those stories, I would have been cringing. So, well, hey, let's jump into the word of the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, this show, we always focus on what is that pivotal word of leadership that sums up the our guest on the show. And uh, obviously, this show is no different. We, worked, we reached out to the Admiral ahead of time and yes, said, sir. you know, what word would you say best describes you and your career that means the most for mm -hmm. you? And Ray, would you do the honor? Yeah, the word that the Admiral chose was persevere. 
And so, sir, what I do is I just read it right off of Webster's. And then what we like to do is have you elaborate on what it means to you. So right off uh, the dictionary right here, to persist in anything undertaken, maintain a purpose in spite of difficulty, obstacles, and discouragement, uh, continue steadfastly. So that is the Webster's Dictionary. I think you're going to have probably a little bit different uh, version of that, sir, if you may. Yeah, I don't know that my version is that much different. But the fact of the matter is, as you guys all know, you know, when you go through SEAL training, and, and particularly nowadays, I get a lot of young kids coming up to me, you know, wanting to know what the secret of getting through SEAL training is. And they'll ask me, you know, should I run more? You know, should I do more push-ups? Should I do more pull-ups? And of course, the answer is always the same. You just don't quit. And they say, no, 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 I, I understand that. I said, no, I'm not sure you do. I said, the fact of the matter is, you'll have a thousand opportunities going through SEAL training to quit. You just don't quit. You have to persevere. So, you know, when, when all you guys think about going through training, you think about those nights where you are cold, wet, and miserable, and you just continue to press through. And then you get into the SEAL teams. And frankly, you know, for my career uh, and, and, you know, knowing you, you guys' background, it, not a lot different. You know, and, and Jason, certainly you had to overcome an incredible amount of, of challenges. Um, but in my career, as a young lieutenant, I was fired from a job. Uh, you know, I was at an elite East Coast SEAL team. You know, you, you think you're doing great. And the next thing you know, the commanding officer comes up and says, hey, you are no longer wanted here. Uh, you know, you've got to go on and, and find employment elsewhere. Well, that's a, you know, that's a tough thing to stomach. And you make a decision right then and there. Well, OK, my career could be over. And I remember, you know, I, I credit my wife. and We've been married 41 years. But this was uh, one of the first times in my career. When, you know, I thought about quitting and she said to me, she said, you know, you've never quit at anything in your life. Don't start now. And this was about persevering. It was about persevering through the failure of not, you know, excelling at that SEAL team. It was about persevering through the, the whispers that you hear. And, you know, you know how the team guys are. Uh, it's like any organization, you know, you screw up. Everybody knows you screwed up. Uh, and, and now they may come up to you and say, hey, Bill, how you doing? You know. Yeah, you know, you're a great guy and everything, and you know what they're thinking. Are you good enough to be one of my officers? Are you good enough to lead SEALs in combat? Are you good enough to be part of these teams? And you have to persevere through that. You have to overcome that uh, and continue to press on. And then, again, throughout the course of your career, you're always challenged with whether it's constant fam family moves, whether it is things that don't go right at a command. And then, of course, after 9-11, uh, every day was kind of a challenge. Uh, you make mistakes in combat. Uh, things don't always go well, and you have to decide whether or not you're going to kind of persevere through the challenges. So I, I, I certainly am no smarter, no more talented, no more heroic, no more brave, no more accomplished than anybody else I know. In fact, I am well below most of those standards. But the one thing I learned very early on was you just have to persevere through the challenging times. And sometimes success comes to those folks that persevere. And, you know, those folks that don't persevere, they go on to do other things. Admiral, I can definitely relate to that. For our listeners that are out there, obviously, I mean, those that know me know that I had a leadership failure in my career also. Uh, I talk about it. Really, it's the, the basis of the Trident and that journey of leadership, being able to overcome and conquer. Thank you. You know, those, uh, those hard lessons. Uh, and I, I go into it in a little bit of depth in the new book. But a question I have for you, because I know I've felt it a lot. People, even to this day, you find people that want to bring those things up. Uh, you made it all the way to the very senior level of your career. Uh, and we, we carry these scars. It's one of the things I talk right. about and overcome. You know, we have these life ambushes that come along. My leadership failure was one of the life ambushes I went through. I, I have no doubt it was one of the ones you went through because obviously you talk about the journey where, you know, thank God we have our long haired admirals who keep us in check because mine made a big difference for me also. But what advice would you give to the others out there when we're going through these periods, when we've had these failures, when we've been knocked down and we're driving forward, but we always have the naysayers. We always have the haters sure. that want to bring it back up and throw it in your face. Even as you climb higher, how do you stay focused on, hey, I learned from that and this is where what I learned from it. How do you stay focused on that? What advice would you pass on to those out there who are moving up their own leadership ladder and they've got those scars, those life ambushes they've encountered? 
Yeah, you know, you can certainly turn uh, the challenges and the failures into successes. And, uh, and I think, you know, most of the great men and women I know have had failures. Uh, they have had, you know, failures of leadership, failures of management, sometimes failures of integrity. And, uh, and, and so you have to be able to overcome these. And, and I can't think of a single successful person I know who hasn't had to over overcome some failure. So you have to learn from the failure. So you really have to be, I think, self-critical. And so as I went through this, uh, you know, I look back and said, okay, what could I have done better? Uh, and, and, but you also have to have confidence in yourself and realize that, yeah, you could have done a lot of things better. Uh, now you have to go out and work twice as hard. And the thing that I have learned, uh, I think, early on in my life is that to overcome the challenges, you double down on work. So you have to work harder than everybody else. You have to prove, I mean, and it is proving. You've got to prove yourself. I, I tell a story. When I was a, a Navy captain, a senior Navy captain, I was working in the White House. Uh, as you know, Jay, I, I had a parachute accident, got severely banged up. But this was about a year and a half after the parachute accident, and I was just starting to kind of rehab. And I went from Washington, D.C. down to Virginia Beach, and we had a little SEAL. Uh, the, the Commodore down there had invited me down. And so I'm with a bunch of SEALs, and we're doing our usual kind of PT, and then we're going to go for a run. Well, again, my parachute accident had been pretty severe. I'd, I'd busted my pelvis, uh, ripped a bunch of muscles out. So, so I kind of get through the PT, but then we're going to go for a 10-mile run. And so we start off, and, and I, I hang for about 200 yards, you know. And then, of course, the guys leave me. And it was a couple of two-mile loops around uh, one of the parks there in, in Virginia Beach. And I remember at one point in time, as I am falling way behind, a guy comes up to me, and, and I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And he says to me, he goes, he says, Captain, I don't understand. He says, you don't have anything left to prove. Why are you doing this? And, you know, why are you out here running with the guys after you've been busted up? Because, you know, you were the Commodore. You're coming from the White House. You've got nothing left to prove. And that guy was absolutely wrong. The nice. fact of the matter is, certainly in the teams, my philosophy has been every single day you wake up, you've got to prove that you are good enough to earn that trident, to own that it. trident. Yeah. If the day comes when you think that you've accomplished everything you can accomplish and that you're as good as you're going to be, then you probably need to step aside because you're not there. Now, every day is a challenge. Every single day you have to prove you are good enough. And that failure for me uh, back in you know, 1983, 1984, that failure to me kind of reinforce the fact that, hey, you know, you can be on top of the world one day and then get knocked down the next. And that's going to happen. Then you just work twice as hard and get back to proving that you are good enough to be whatever your position is, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a policeman, a fireman, or a SEAL. I love it. I love it. I, I got to tell you, I'm not going to tip off the uh, readers because they need to go read your book, Sea Stories. But uh, Ray and I affectionately called your skydiving accident the wishbone yeah. accident. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet you felt like an uh, 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 unlucky turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> All but, right. you know, Jay, I, I'm always quick to point out that, uh, you know, the, the story, while a lot of people kind of focus on that, you know, when I look at the, uh, the guys like you and others, uh, who, who really uh, had serious accidents and injuries as a result of, uh, you know, combat operations. I mean, my accident paled in comparison. Uh, the point I tried to make in that particular story, it was it, it took a whole lot of people to get me up and running again. Uh, it took my wife to be my nurse. Uh, Admiral Olson kind of made sure I was able to stay in the Navy. You know, the guys came around and kept my morale up and got me working again. And as you know, if you don't have those, uh, those fellow frogmen, those comrades, those friends to help you through the tough times, uh, it, life can be pretty doggone challenging. So, you know, my, my parachute accident, uh, as traumatic as it might have seemed, really paled in comparison to what you, know, you and so many guys uh, and gals have been through after 9-11. Amen. And I, I appreciate you saying that. And I know for all the other wounded warriors mm -hmm. that are out there. But, uh, you know, one of the things Ray and I have talked about a lot on this show is, you know, everybody lives in their own personal hell, and it's easy to sometimes take a look at somebody else that may be going through something hard, and what it can give you perspective, which is a great thing, it can motivate you, but it also can, you know, make you uh, 
feel sorry for yourself because you're like, God, you know, why should I be, why should I be struggling through this? So the bottom line is everybody lives in their own personal hell. You got to drive forward. That's all that it comes down to every day, proving yourself driving forward. You did it and you ended up at the, uh, you know, just making an incredible contribution to both the SEAL community by setting the example. So I think it's great. Okay. I got my question, sir. Far away. H- here we go. We're rewinding. <laughs> Right. Horns. We're rewinding. University of Texas, 2014. I was the motivational coach for the UCLA Bruins working under Coach Salalosi and Coach Jim Moore. And it happened. We heard it. There was this epic speech that someone gave. Um, the question I have, sir, is probably one of the most impactful speeches I've ever heard. I, I, I looked it up this morning. You Currently right now, 10,028,000 10, views. Yeah. But the thing is, is the question I have with you, sir, is let's two part question. One, what inspired you to give that specific speech? And two, did you think you were going to receive the impact? Did you? I mean, when I have a bad day and this is a a seal who's my job is I motivate people. I'm not going to bullshit you, sir. I listen to this and it's not a short speech, but it's I call it my Shawshank Redemption. It's something that (laughs) once I start, once it comes on, I can't put it down. So. Can you kind of elaborate, sir, to why you yeah, gave that speech? And you know. Yeah, so the, uh, I am a University of Texas at Austin graduate. So, uh, you know, kind of after the bin Laden raid and there was some notoriety behind that, the president of UT asked me to come be the commencement speaker for the, the class of 2014. And, uh, and I had actually been working on another speech. And, you know, I had a day job. I was the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to write this thing. And I... I'd piddle around with it on the weekend. And then finally, uh, kind of sat down and started writing it. Well, the Wednesday before the Saturday I was supposed to give the speech, I realized it didn't work. Uh, You know, a good speech has got to have a beginning, a middle, and end. It's got to have a theme. And the speech I had written wasn't working. So, you know, I went down to my wife. I was, you know, a little bit in a panic mode in light of the fact that I was going to be standing before 30,000 students and parents here on Saturday. And she says to me, why don't you write about something you know? I thought, oh, that's a clever idea. I said, the problem is, you know, all I know is how to be a SEAL. And I'm about to, you know, step up in front of 8,000 graduates. I'm going to be in uniform. I don't, I don't know whether or not, uh, you know, uh, students want to hear about being a SEAL. But I realized that uh, I could take the lessons from SEAL training and, and maybe turn them into life lessons. So that kind of became the the approach, it was, and again, as you guys well know, uh, this was, these are just lessons that you learn going through SEAL training. And of course, we started out every day by making our bed and getting that inspected. And, and then I, I talked about the Munchkin crew and, and a number of other things. So it really was just a chronology of, of my SEAL training. Did I think it would get this kind of traction? Absolutely not. Uh, and in fact, to show you kind of what an old guy I am, when I got through giving the speech, uh, one of my, uh, my security guys comes up to me afterwards and says, hey, Abel, your speech is trending on YouTube. Well, I didn't know what the hell trending on YouTube <laughs> meant. Um, so uh, I said, well, I guess that's a good thing unless it's trending poorly. Um, but, uh, but then it, it just uh, it kind of took off. And, I, you know, I think the reason it has gained so much traction is that, as you guys can appreciate, they're simple lessons. And we're frogmen, you know, we don't, we try not to complicate things. So these are not complicated things. Uh, you know, making your bed is not something that's hard to do, but we also know that that can be pretty impactful. And it's not, it's not about making your bed. It is about doing something every morning that kind of gets you up and gets you moving, that you take a little pride in, that kind of encourages you to do another thing and another. And of course, the making your bed was also about doing the little things well. I mean, if there's one thing we've learned in the SEAL teams is, you have to be able to do the little things well, clean your weapon, take care of your gear, you know, know the playbook on a mission, do the little things well, and you'll be able to do the big things well. So, uh, so I was pleased that so many folks have, uh, have enjoyed the, the speech. 
Yeah. yeah, if you have not seen this speech, definitely just go on YouTube, check it out. It is an amazing speech. I mean, when I was running my uh, when I was running my organization and one of the we were running our Overcome Academy, the leadership program for wounded warriors, we were teaching them how to speak. And I actually used your speech as one of the templates to show them the flow of a speech and how well you set it up, the use of humor, all those things. So, yeah, my daughter is she's eleven now, sir, and I showed her that video back in the day, and she used to get up. And we used to help her, but now she's 11. She makes her own bed. You know, I always tell her sense of accomplishment. You do one great thing, let's do something else and something else. So my point is, is thank you for that, sir, because it actually changed my life. And I mean, it's amazing. Admiral, you know, you talk about doing the little things well. And and first off, I just want to tell you once again, thank you so much for contributing to my book. The stories that you share and overcome are amazing. Yes, and and it's actually one of these stories that actually relates directly to what you're talking about. And, it, and it's holding ourselves accountable. It is making sure we do all the little things well. And you tell the story of uh, going to Shkin, which is an outpost on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, a really hard place to be, a place where our troops were always coming into contact. And you had an individual that basically had been out there too long. He was supposed to provide a brief to you and a more senior ranking officer at the time. I believe you were, you were uh, one star at that time and the army officer was maybe a two or a three star. And uh, this individual was not prepared for the brief and pretty much had scrapped all protocol that there was. Uh, and when you and as a matter of fact, he, he just didn't do certain things that in the military we always do. I don't care where you are. Um, you know, unless you're in the middle of a battlefield, we obviously don't salute there. But other than that, we follow protocol because it's what makes exactly like your speech talks about. These little things make the big things work. And, uh, and, and you talk about that in the book, how critical it is as a leader that we have to hold not only ourselves, but our people accountable. Um, for anybody out there, can you elaborate just a little more on that? Because I meet so many leaders that have a hard time having those hard conversations when they notice that something's out of alignment, but they're like, ah, you know, I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to hold my, pe you know, I, I know I should say something, but I'm not going to. And I think even you in that story talk about for a few minutes, you debated whether you're going to say something because of the conditions. And then you said, you know what, the right thing, the right thing. So can you elaborate a little bit on that in leadership? We have a lot of leaders that listen to this podcast. I think this point of accountability is such a critical one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and you're right. It, it is critical. Uh, it's particularly critical for leaders or managers in any position. The fact of the matter is everybody that joins an organization wants to join an elite organization. I don't care whether you are working at the pizza place, whether you're working at the post office, whether you're working at an elite SEAL team. Nobody says, gee, I want to be part of a mediocre organization. Yeah, where's that mediocre organization? That's what I want to go join. No, you want to be part of a great organization. Organizations are great because you set high standards and you hold people accountable for meeting those standards. Soldiers in particular <clears throat> want to be good soldiers. They want to make sure that the, the work they are doing is noble and is honorable. Uh, they want to be held accountable because they understand that in order for them to be part of a great organization, you have to have high standards and you want people to achieve those high standards. There's a great book. Uh, called Morale, just like it sounds. Morale by a guy named John Baines. And I had read the book, uh, you know, probably 20 years before. It's a hard to find book. I'd read it at the Naval Postgraduate School. And, and Baines goes back and he does research on the 5th Scottish Rifles. The 5th Scottish Rifles. And they were a unit prior to World War I in the British Army that was considered one of the worst units in the British Army. And so he, he, uh, he details why they were such a bad unit. And they were a bad unit because the commanding officer treated those that performed well no differently than those slackers. So, you know, he didn't push the slackers to become better. Uh, and, and consequently, those guys who were busting their hump said, why am I busting my hump? Why am I trying to look sharp? Why am I trying to be the best soldier I can when the slackers are treated just the same way? Well, prior to World War I, a new commanding officer comes in and he says, Hey, boys, here's the deal. We are going to become the best unit in the British Army. Here's the standards that I expect of everybody. And if you can't meet those standards, you're going to go somewhere else. So he turns the unit around. They go on during the Battle of New Chapelle in uh, 1915 to be one of the most decorated units in the British Army. 
But the point of the book about morale is, just as we all know in the military, if you don't set the standards and hold people accountable, then before long, that good order and discipline, which is essential for every single thing we do, particularly on the battlefield. You know, we, we think of good order and discipline, to your point, Jason, about, okay, this is just something you do in garrison. You know, this is where we make sure we have good uniforms, that we're clean shaven, uh, you know, that we salute when we need to, that we have the right military protocol. Let me tell you, that is even more important when you are in combat. Because in combat, the soldiers, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, if you allow them to kind of get off the reservation, to kind of go to the dark side, because combat will do that, as you know. When you start killing people on a daily basis, when you see your buddies blown up, when all of a sudden you're living in a place like Skin or someplace else, and you don't have to shave every day, and you don't have to put on a decent-looking uniform, and you don't have to do these sort of things, before long, it affects your own personal morale. And before long, the good order and discipline starts to decline. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you when we talked last time, but when I became the commander of, uh, of JSOC, I, I went over to uh, Afghanistan, and uh, I pulled one of the Navy captains in, who was my chief of staff, and I said, uh, I said, Bill, I said, I want to send out a message. I'm telling everybody to cut their beards, shave their beards off. And I remember he said to me, he said, sir, sir you can't do that. I mean, you know, we, we, need to, we need to have a committee. You know, we need to take a hard look at this. Uh, we, need to, we need to do a, yeah, a thorough examination. And I said, uh, okay, Bill, I'll tell you what. I'll give you one week. Uh, and then when, uh, when you come back in a week, I'm still going to tell them to cut off their beards. Said, sir, sir, that's not intellectually honest. He said, we, I said, okay, you go talk to the non-commissioned officers and then get back to me. So about two weeks later, he comes back and his, his head's kind of down. He said, uh, I said, Bill, what's up? And he said, well, sir, he said, uh, I've talked to all the NCOs. I've gone to all the outposts. I've talked to all the sergeant majors and the mass chiefs. They think we need to cut the beards off. And so we cut the beards off except for those guys that truly needed them, the guys who were working kind of undercover. Uh, and the reason we did that was because, as you know, when you grew a beard in Afghanistan or in Iraq, it just it took away from a little bit of what we know soldiers need. The soldiers want to wake up as, as much of a pain in the ass as it is. You get up every morning, you shave. You may not have a, a crisp starch uniform, but doggone it, you put on something that looks like a uniform because you want to have good order and discipline. You want to have a military bearing about you. And when you start growing that big Afghan beard and you can kind of snarl at people through that and, and everything about it starts to change. As soon as we cut off the beards, I mean, the guys, all of a sudden you could see morale come up. You could see they had to change because doggone it, they were soldiers again. It's a small thing. It's a little bit like making your bed. Um, but you have to, as a commander, you have to reinforce the good order and discipline. Or when you're in the middle of combat, it is easy to go to the dark side, to have people start to go down that slippery slope, and then they feel bad about themselves. You know, they, they get into firefights and maybe shoot people they shouldn't shoot, or they, they do something that they regret later on because nobody kept them in the box. My job as a commander was to keep the guys in the moral, legal, and ethical box as much as you could in a wartime environment. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and that's what it's about as a leader you know, to, to hold the, hold people accountable. I think it's awesome. I think it's so important. And so many leaders sometimes are afraid to do that, not recognizing the, this long-term impact. I want to flip it around to another story you tell in Sea Stories that I found fascinating because it's almost the flip side of this in when things go wrong, sometimes there is an opportunity to capitalize on a bad decision. And it is the story you told about one night you got a, a late night phone call and you were told, Hey, I, I got bad news. We've got some, you were going after a high value target, a guy that had been going into Syria and basically launching his operations out of Syria and then going back across the border. And you guys were trying to figure out a way to get this guy. And all of a sudden, one night, accidentally, uh, a group of army operators found themselves on the other side of the border, which is a big no-no without high level approval. And uh, you immediately implemented uh, emergency action procedures. And then you went to your boss, who was General Petraeus at the time. And this story fascinated me because you, when I read what Petraeus asked you first, which was, did you let them keep going? 
<laughs> and I was dumbfounded by that. But it also made me recognize that good leaders recognize sometimes we have to make risky decisions. And th- what is your advice for leaders out there when things are starting to go off the rails? Where can you look for those opportunities to capitalize on a mistake where you could actually turn it into your advantage, you know, uh, because that was a perfect situation where this occurred. And I'll be honest, I don't even think you saw that coming when when Petraea said that to you. <laughs> but I, I found that story fascinating. And I thought there were so many deep lessons in it as a leader that, you know, a good leaders sometimes have to make risky decisions. And obviously, sometimes they don't pan out so well. And other times, you know, you walk away looking like the prawn king. Right. It's funny. Uh, I was just with General Petraeus last week, and we were talking about this story because he read the book, and and he remembered the event very clearly. So your timing is perfectly on, perfect on this. Yeah, you know, I think this is the real nature of leadership, Jay. Is it, it's you know, I tell folks, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, are, are good leaders born, or can you make a good leader? My answer is always the same. You can absolutely positively make a good leader. I mean, this is what the military does every single day. We take young men and women you know, from all corners of, of the globe, and we teach them, you know, good order and discipline, we teach them how to be responsible, we teach them how to, how to take the right actions, and they can become good leaders. However, I would offer that great leaders, the truly great men and women that lead, that there is something in their DNA that is just a little bit different. It is their ability to see opportunities, as you pointed out, in the midst of where other people may not see opportunities. I had the chance to work for General Petraeus on three separate occasions. I think, frankly, more than any other Army officer. So I worked for him when he was in Iraq. I worked for him as a CENTCOM commander. And then I worked for him uh, when he was in Afghanistan. And, and I have tremendous respect for General Petraeus. And this was one of those times when, ha- having worked for him, uh, this was in Iraq, uh, having worked for him, you know, he's also a pretty stern guy. And he can wire brush you pretty quick if you do something wrong. So what, what I found amazing about that night was, as you point out, so my army operators had gone across the border into Syria to get this bad guy. They weren't supposed to be there. Uh, I like to think that I had handled it well on my end by going back to the army colonel and saying, I got it. Let's not overreact to this, uh, but I still got to notify Petraeus. So when I went to see Petraeus, my expectation was that he was going to fire me up and he was going to wire brush me and say, WTF, what were you thinking? You know, <laughs> um, and instead he kind of paused. I think he realized again, because of his experience, that we were trying to do the right thing. The guys were trying to do right, even if they got a little overzealous. And so, you know, he said to me, well, you probably should let them keep going. And then, you know, uh, when he found out, I said, well, I've already recalled them. They should be back, you know, across the border here within the hour. And he said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll keep this between you and me unless something goes south. And I really appreciated that. And it was a great learning experience for me. So you think, you know, by that time, I'm a three-star admiral. I've experienced an awful lot in my career, but you can always learn something more. And, uh, and there were many times in my time as the JSOC commander and the SOCOM commander. And, and, and frankly, I think before that, it's not, it's not that it's a lesson I hadn't learned. But you get a lot of opportunity to implement that lesson in a wartime environment. When you see guys that are out there in a combat environment getting shot at, they are trying to do right, but they don't always, it doesn't always come off well. And you as the leader, yeah, you can bring them in, you can wire brush them. What you have to be able to do is you bring them in, you talk through the mistakes they made. If the mistakes they made were honest mistakes trying to do the right thing, then you just correct those mistakes and you move forward. If now, you know, uh, conversely, if the mistakes they made uh, were kind of premeditated bad mistakes uh, that were not kind of upholding the, you know, what is, uh, you know, moral, legal, and ethical, if they were those kind of mistakes, then you handle it differently. But if it were mistakes that were trying to do the right thing for all the right reasons, then you have to cut them some slack and move forward. Nice. Well, I know I've had some slack <laughs> cut in my career, so. <laughs> we all have. Yeah. We all have. So, uh well, you know, there's so much. I mean, we could probably spend hours. Uh, there's so many lessons, both that you share in, in my book, obviously the lessons you have in your book, in the Make Your Bed book, all these things, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, let's fast forward. You now are out there, and recently you created a little bit of a firestorm 
You uh, you did something that a lot in the military say, oh, my God, we should never do this. And you wrote an op-ed that basically questioned President Trump and about some of the recent decision making and some of the division we're seeing in this country. And uh, I, I know, you know, I, I see individuals on both, uh, you know, the right and the left. You know, I have some uh, individuals on the right who just are so upset at that op-ed. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Why, you know, where do you really stand, right? You know, where, what motivated you to write that? Yeah, well, first, uh, you know, I've told folks, uh, you know, is, is, uh, as you well know, there is this kind of unwritten rule that is retired senior officers, uh, we don't question the commander in chief. And I think that is a good rule. And I have told folks, you know, I've received a lot of criticism for this. And I think it is fair criticism. So when somebody comes up and says, you know, Admiral, you shouldn't have done that. I said, you know, that's fair criticism. Having said that, uh, you know, my oath was to the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and, and consequently, I've got to wake up every morning and look myself in the mirror and decide, is being quiet uh, more, more honorable than, than speaking out? And sometimes, you know, you, you just have to make the decision that you think speaking out is, is worth uh, the criticism you're going to take. Um, so in this particular case, and I've told folks before, I said, this is, I want the president to do well. Uh, every American should want the president to do well. And, and frankly, I don't have a lot of disagreements with some of the president's policies. Uh, you know, I, I think we need a strong border. I think we need to engage China on their unfair trade acts. I think, you know, going out, while I wouldn't have engaged North Korea the way the president has, I don't have any problem with, uh, with him engaging with Kim Jong-un. Uh, you know, should we pull out of Syria? Well, I think these are policy discussions. And I have no issues with, you know, uh, good folks on both sides of the aisle having honest discussions about policy decisions. My concern uh, and the reason I wrote the op-ed really had to do as much with uh, the president not uh, adhering to the process. And so, in, again, and this really wasn't about Gallagher. I mean, Gallagher was the kind of face of the discussion, and Syria was about the face of the discussion. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, let, let's take Syria to start with, because that's kind of what drove uh, the beginning of the op-ed, uh, was, this, was this idea that you know, pre the president re really didn't engage with his military leadership before he tweeted the fact that we are pulling out of, of Syria. Um, so if he had gone through the process and had a serious engagement with the military and had good discussions with his principals, though the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the others, and said, look, uh, I'm thinking about pulling out of Syria, what do you think? Then the military could have come back and said, well, Mr. President, uh, th then if we're going to do that, we need to do that in a, in a measured fashion so that we can take care of our allies, so that we can do this so that our guys aren't at risk, et cetera. But of course, that is not the way it unfolded. It unfolded in a tweet, and it caught a lot of the military leadership off guard. The issue with the Gallagher case, of course, has been that the president, um, well within his right to pardon Gallagher or anybody else after the courts martial or after the proceedings. Uh, there is a thing called you know, unlawful command influence, unlawful command influence. It is a violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice for any senior officer in the chain of command to opine on the outcome of a proceeding, a tribunal, or a course martial before it is complete. And the reason you can't do that is because, you know, it, when I was the Commodore of Naval Special Warfare Group 1, I was not allowed to go down and tell the commanding officer of SEAL Team 1 how I thought his captain's mask should come out. That's unlawful command influence or undue influence. You can't do that. And of course, for the president of the United States to come out and talk about, uh, again, really not, not having anything to do with Gallagher, but the president of the United States is not supposed to put his position out there before these things are completed. Now, once a jury has you know, come out, once a court's martial is complete, once a tribunal or a proceeding is over, then the president can absolutely make the decision. And I don't have any problems with that. But this really was an issue of, you know, the president has, you know, come out against the intelligence community. He's come out against the law enforcement community. He's come out against the State Department. And now, of course, he's beginning to kind of come out against the deep state uh, that he feels that the military leadership has. 
And I just think this undermines, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the important uh, aspects of, of who we are as a nation. The president should be supporting those institutions rather than trying to undermine them. But having said all that, I want the president to do well. Uh, I want all of, you know, the American institutions to do well. We just need his help in, uh, in getting there. Amen. Yeah, I'm into that. I mean, there's a lot of division in this country right now. I think for all of us, I know I do. I want to see ways that we can bring it back together to bring the American people back together and unified and and, and understanding the beliefs and the foundation of what this nation is. I mean, that's what I fought for. It's what I signed up for. It's what I'll continue to fight for. So uh, I I respect you taking a stance. Uh, I know you've gotten a lot of heat for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's what it's about in this, and you know, it's about taking a stance, you know, Amen. you know, much better to, uh, stand by your convictions, be heard instead of, uh, wallow in silence. Amen. Amen. So, so sir, right. as we're, we're starting to wrap up, I'd like to kind of give you a brief, uh, rundown of what's going to happen. Uh, first, let me explain, uh, when we wrap up, we like to do what's called the two minute segment of motivational, just, we like to end with the two minutes of what you know, your word of the day means each one of us likes to hit on it. Um, and that's where we really like to close home. But before we do that, this is probably one of the most beneficial points that I think people can get away from here, especially coming from you is what three pieces of advice would you give to a leader? That's, the, that's it. I mean, I, I, I can't say junior leader. I can't say senior leader because you're, you've been there, you've done both. So if you were in an elevator and, and, you had 30 seconds to tell yeah, someone yeah. You had three to tell pieces a young of officer, advice. Yeah, what would you tell me? Yeah, that's pretty straightforward for me. You know, we expect our leaders to be servant leaders. So the answer is you take care of the troops. Take care of the troops and the troops will take care of you. I mean, it, it is as simple as that. Now, let me expand on that a little bit because taking care of the troops doesn't mean, you know, giving them every Friday off and, and cutting them slack when they don't look sharp. Taking care of the troops means you know, you set high expectations, you give them the resources to do the job, and you, then you hold them accountable when they are not achieving the expectations and the standards you expect. That is taking care of the troops. Because again, every troop, again, as I said before, whether, whether you're working in the pizza place, or the post office, or, or the SEAL team, everybody wants to be part of a great organization. So to be part of a great organization, you set high standards, you give the men and women the resources to do the job, and then you hold them accountable when they don't do the job. That's how you move a great organization along. So that would be, you know, part one. Part two is for a leader, you really have to get down with the troops. Uh, there's a, a great uh, saying from the Pope uh, that, that says, uh, a shepherd should smell like his sheep. A <laughs> shepherd should smell like his sheep. I like that because it is about the fact that Hey, when I was a three star, I would go out on missions, you know, maybe once or twice a month. Uh, And part of this was the troops want to see you sharing the dangers, sharing the hardships with them. Uh, They don't want to think that their admiral is, you know, sitting there in Bagram or in Balad, you know, drinking a cup of coffee while they're there getting shot at. You have to get down there and find out what the troops are going through. Uh, But this isn't just about combat. I tell CEOs all the time, look, you need to go down to the mail room or whatever the equivalent of the mail room is and do the mail room job. Find out what the guys in the mail room and the gals in the, in the mail room are doing so that you can make better decisions that are going to affect your organization. One of the best lessons I learned was when I was a Navy midshipman at the University of Texas. In between your freshman and sophomore year, they send you on what they euphemistically call a cruise. So I went as a, as a midshipman, I went out to the USS Olet. It was a fast frigate out of Pearl Harbor. And as a budding officer, they make you an enlisted guy. So you live with the enlisted men, you know, down in the, uh, in the barracks. I mean, you, you're, you're scrubbing the deck, you're cleaning the heads, you're working in the boiler rooms. And it gives you this great sense of the fact that the officers that are above decks, you know, on the bridge, in the staterooms, making the decisions, how those decisions affect the sailor at the deck plate level. And it is the greatest lesson I had is that as an officer or a leader, when you make a decision, you better understand how that decision affects everybody in your organization. 
The only way you will know that is if you share the hardships with them, if you share the pain with them, if you have been and been there and done that job. You know, we're fortunate as SEALs is that we all go through training together. And, and, and we, we know, you know, kind of what we've all been through. That's how the officers and the enlisted guys kind of earn the respect. Uh, and I think that's important. But at the end of the day, it really is about taking care of the troops and then, you know, leading from the front. And sometimes leading from the front means getting down and, and doing the jobs with the guys. Amen. Well, awesome, uh, wow. sir. It's just been an honor to have you on. I mean, just a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of leadership. I mean, your your <laughs> your professional resume is yeah. awesome. So, nice thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you for contributing to my book. We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two right. minutes. So we're gonna you you want to go first? I don't know who goes. I guess we let him decide. Yeah, well, so so the way we do this, real quickly, we wrap it up. We go back to the word of the day, which uh, persevere. So just shotgun this, and and actually, how about I'll go just so you can kind of see how we do it. It's really fast. Our shotgun approach. Okay. Then, then we'll let the and then we'll man. let you have the last word. Yes, Admiral. sir. All right. So, all right. The word of the day today is persevere. Our amazing guest, Admiral Bill McRaven, talked about it was the quintessential thing that really allowed his career to go forward. I got to tell you, I feel his pain when we talk about a leadership failure. It was what enabled me to drive forward. So many times. I questioned myself. I doubted myself. You know, I felt the naysayers and it was my ability to drive forward and persevere and lean on great people around me. That social leadership I talk about, it was persevering and driving forward. When you are down, when you were on the X, when you have those life ambushes, you have to persevere, drive forward. Amen. Persevere, attack the hill, ladies and gentlemen. No matter how bad it gets, you've got to keep pushing forward, keep pushing upward. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. Uh, leaders at levels from the top to bottom, bottom to top are going to make mistakes. My motto is fail till you succeed, but just put 100% of who you are and put that mindset into everything that you're doing. You will overcome and conquer everything that you set your mind to. I am sitting here among two great individuals who I respect very much in the SEAL teams. I'm in awe. So, sir, excuse me, Admiral, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, persevere. Never ring the bell. It's pretty simple. You know, you'll always have that opportunity to quit, and you'll think it's easy. Uh, you will think quitting makes things better. It never makes things better. And as long as you kind of go into life with this, uh, this attitude that you're never going to ring the bell, you're never going to quit, then, uh, then you'll be successful in life. Amen. Boom. I, I got, love it. I got nothing. All right. Holy smokes. Well, this has been another episode of the Overcome and Conquer show. I am Jason Overcome Redman. And I'm Ray Cash Care. And we are out. Boom. Thanks for listening to the Overcome and Conquer show. Tune in next time. And please remember to subscribe on iTunes. Please visit overcomeandconquer.com. The Overcome and Conquer show is presented by The Project. The Project is a full immersion, 75-hour experience designed for men who know in their core they are not living up to their fullest potential. Rather than waking up every morning ready to dominate life, the mediocre man rolls out of bed and slides into the same unfulfilling routine they've unhappily been in for way too long. The project is for men that have lost their eternal flame and motivation to conquer. It is for men living an unfulfilling life that lacks the excitement and purpose. If this resonates with you and you want to learn more, we encourage you to apply today at www.mdkproject.com forward slash OC show. Boom.